So I have a job in the subway. It's not your regular 9 to 5 type of work. I go in whenever the trains are running. The city never stops, and neither do the subways. I work on the maintenance crew down in the tunnels of Boston's oldest subway lines. The walls down there are so old, they could probably tell you stories from over a hundred years ago. I never believed much in ghost stories. When you work underground, you hear all kinds of weird sounds. There's rats running around, old pipes making noise, and sometimes you hear someone's laughter echo down the tunnel. But one night, the sounds were different. I was down near Park Street Station, where the green line and red line meet. There's a part of the tunnel there that nobody likes to go, not even the most experienced workers. We got a call on the radio about the lights flickering and power going on and off. It was my turn to check it out, so I grabbed my flashlight and toolkit. It was just after midnight, and the last of the night trains were passing through. That night, the tunnel was damper than usual, like when a storm is coming. Everyone said it was because of the humidity. The lights in the tunnel were doing that thing where they dim and then get really bright, almost like they might burst. I walked carefully along the track, making sure not to get too close to the third rail. If you touch that, it can be deadly. I got to the spot where the lights were acting up and started working. I was checking the cables and connectors when, all of a sudden, the lights went out completely. Not even flickering. Just gone. The backup lights didn't come on like they should have, so it was pitch black. I couldn't even see my own hand in front of my face. Then I heard it. It wasn't the sound of a rat, and it wasn't a train. It was a low, mean growl. The kind that makes you feel like you're in danger, like a wild animal is about to attack. I turned on my headlamp, but even that seemed to flicker. The light cut through the darkness and then I saw them. Eyes. Not little rat eyes. And not human eyes. They were red, glowing like the end of a cigarette in the dark, and they were staring right at me. My heart was pounding, and I wanted to run but my legs wouldn't move. The growling got louder, which meant whatever it was, it was getting closer. I knew I had to do something. I finally got my legs to move and started backing away slowly, never taking my eyes off those glowing red dots. I thought, this is it. Some kind of subway monster is going to get me. All the normal things I usually complained about didn't seem so bad anymore. I would have promised to never complain again if I could just get out of there. As I stood there, frozen, I heard a train in the distance. It wasn't supposed to be coming yet. I was supposed to have time before the next one. But there it was, coming down the track. The noise and the lights from the train should have scared off whatever was in the tunnel, right? Animals don't like loud noises or bright lights. But those eyes, they didn't move. They stayed right where they were, watching me. The train got closer and for a second I felt a bit relieved. But the eyes didn't blink, didn't flinch. That's when I realized, this thing wasn't scared at all. The train was speeding towards me, and I was stuck, standing between the train and those eyes. At the last second, I jumped out of the way and pressed myself against the wall of the tunnel. The train rushed by, a blur of noise and wind. I could feel the bricks pressing into my back from the pressure as it passed. The wind hit me like a slap, snapping me out of my fear. When the train finally passed, the eyes were gone. The tunnel was just a tunnel again. The air wasn't heavy anymore, just damp. And I was just a guy who almost got hit by a train. I radioed in to say that the power was back on, because for some reason the lights fixed themselves. But then I noticed something else. The silence. No rats, no dripping water, no sounds from above. Nothing. I shook it off, picked up my tools, and started walking back. I kept looking over my shoulder every few steps, just in case. When I finally got back up to the street, I could breathe again. But ever since that night, something's been different. It's like I'm a kid again, scared of the dark. 
I can't stop thinking about those red eyes or that growl that wasn't just a normal sound. I tell myself it was just too much coffee, but deep down, I know better. Now, every time I go down into those tunnels, I wonder if I'll hear that growl again. I wonder if I'll see those eyes watching me. And I can't help but think, what if that train hadn't come early? What would have happened then? Strange things happen all the time. I know that, but you never really feel the weight of them until you're caught in one. I used to work in search and rescue, so I thought I'd seen it all. Then I saw the creature. I wasn't on duty. I was out climbing on my own, something I did often to stay in shape. It made me more determined to reach the top before dark. The smell of the earth and pine pushed me forward. I'd been eyeing this peak for a while, and I wasn't going to give up before reaching it. Then I heard the howl. It was distant and muffled. It didn't sound like a wolf or a coyote, but I couldn't think of any other animal that might make that noise. I looked in the direction of the sound, saw some birds take off from the trees, and waited until everything was quiet again before moving on. I was still about an hour from the summit. I had all the gear I needed for camping and planned to hike back down the next morning. With nightfall coming fast, I picked up my pace, not thinking much about the howl. Maybe I should have been more careful. Luck seemed to be on my side when I reached the summit. Some trees had fallen, leaving a perfect clearing for my campsite. There were no signs of animals, so I quickly set up camp. I was looking forward to a beautiful view of the stars that night and an even better view of the sunrise in the morning. The night passed quietly and everything seemed fine until something woke me up about an hour before dawn. It started with a loud knocking sound. For a moment I thought I was back home, like someone was banging on my apartment door. But then I remembered where I was. I sat up, confused animals in the wild didn't knock like that. I grabbed a small shovel I had nearby and stepped outside. I wasn't thinking of fighting anything. I just wanted to see what was out there. I called out, but the knocking had stopped. Maybe it was just another hiker playing a prank. I'd seen it happen before, but then I heard rustling at the edge of my campsite. I squinted into the darkness, and that's when I saw it. At first, I thought it was a person, but it was covered in dark, thick fur. Its eyes caught the faint light of the moon, and I could see sharp canine teeth behind its snarling lips. I froze. The shovel I was holding felt useless. I had just climbed a mountain, but at that moment, I had never felt smaller. The creature suddenly charged toward me, running faster than anything I had ever seen. Instinct kicked in, and I ran. I was sure that it was right behind me and that I wouldn't make it out alive. But then I heard it stop. It wasn't chasing me. It was destroying my camp. I heard the tent collapse, my gear being ripped apart, everything scattered on the ground. I didn't stop running until I was halfway down the mountain. Only then did I catch my breath and realize that I was still alive. I still had to make it back to my car, but at least I had survived the night. I told a few close friends, fellow climbers and rescuers, about what happened. Some laughed, others told me to keep quiet about it. A month later, I went back to the campsite. Most of my things were ruined, but I did find footprints. They weren't like any animal tracks I'd ever seen. I tried showing the pictures of the tracks to those friends, but they just told me to delete them and warned me not to go back to that mountain. I'm not sure why. Maybe they know something I don't. What do you think? The locals had always whispered about strange happenings in the Pine Barrens, but no one ever really believed them. The tales of a creature half horse and half bat, with glowing red eyes and wings that could block out the sun, seemed like nothing more than folklore, stories meant to keep children from wandering too far into the woods. 
but that changed one chilly November morning. A young hiker, no more than a teenager, was cutting through the woods. He had heard the stories, of course, but he never thought much of them. The Pine Barrens had always been a peaceful place to him, a sanctuary of quiet away from the small, sleepy towns that dotted the edges of the forest. But on that morning, something was different. The birds, usually the first to announce the dawn with their chirps and whistles, were silent. The wind, always gently stirring the treetops, was still. It was the kind of quiet that pressed on your ears, making the world feel smaller, more confined. That's when he saw it. At first, it was just a shadow, a quick, dark blur that moved between the trees, almost too fast for his eyes to track. He blinked, a branch swaying in the breeze. But then it appeared again, this time clearer, more defined. It moved with an eerie grace, its limbs impossibly long, its body hunched. Its wings, leathery and wide, unfurled in one fluid motion, creating a low, shuddering sound that made the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end. The hiker froze, his body tensed with the primal instinct to flee. But he couldn't move. His eyes were locked on the creature as it hovered above the tree line, its head jerking from side to side, as if searching for something and then disappearing into the fog. The boy ran, feet stumbling over roots and rocks as he fled from the woods, not stopping until he reached the safety of the nearest road. His face was pale, his hands trembling, and his voice barely a whisper as he tried to explain what he had seen. By noon, the news had spread. In a small town like theirs, it didn't take long for stories to circulate, and by evening, everyone was talking about the Jersey Devil. The creature had been part of local folklore for centuries, said to have been born in the 1700s to a woman named Mother Leeds. According to legend, she had cursed her 13th child, and when it was born, it transformed into a monster with the body of a horse, the head of a goat, and wings of a bat. Some believed it was nothing more than a myth, a story passed down through generations, while others swore it was real. A creature lurking in the depths of the Pine Barrens, waiting for the right moment to show itself. For years, the Jersey Devil had been nothing more than an occasional sighting, something talked about over campfires or late-night gatherings. But this time was different. This time, the creature had been seen in broad daylight, the local authorities were skeptical, of course. They chalked it up to overactive imaginations, teenagers looking for attention. But as the reports started to flood in, from hunters, hikers, and even a few local farmers who claimed to have seen strange tracks near their barns, it became harder to ignore. One farmer, a grizzled man who had lived in the area his whole life, claimed he had found the remains of a deer, its body mangled and torn in a way he had never seen before. No animal I know of could have done that, he had said, his voice low and serious. Others reported hearing strange sounds at night, high-pitched screeches that echoed through the trees, unlike anything they had heard before. As the days passed, more and more people began to report sightings of the creature. Some described it as tall and gangly, with long limbs that seemed to stretch unnaturally. Others spoke of its wingspan, claiming it was as wide as a car. The most unsettling detail, however, was always its eyes. Those glowing red orbs that seemed to burn through the darkness, watching, waiting. Panic started to set in. Families began locking their doors and windows at night, keeping their children close. The usually quiet woods were now filled with people, curious onlookers, thrill-seekers, and even a few hunters who believed they could catch the creature. But despite their efforts, the Jersey Devil remained elusive, slipping in and out of the shadows like a ghost. I was a college student studying in a small village nestled in the beautiful mountains of Ireland. 
It was a charming town with an old castle sitting on a hill and a small market square where locals would gather to sell their goods. The people were friendly, and I quickly became friends with a group of other students who were also studying there. But soon, strange things started happening. We began hearing odd noises coming from the castle at night. At first, it was just whispers, but after a while, we started hearing loud wails and screams. It was scary, but we were curious, and despite how silly it seems now, we decided to go investigate. I've always been the adventurous type and have a huge interest in the paranormal. This seemed like a perfect chance to explore something mysterious. My friends were just as curious, so we all agreed to figure out what was really happening at the castle. The first eerie thing we saw was a shadowy figure moving past the castle windows. We were terrified, but at the same time, it was exciting. We all loved ghost shows and paranormal investigations, and now we had our own mystery to solve. We were thrilled. The next day, we explored the castle, but we didn't find anything strange. However, the noises continued at night, and we still couldn't figure out what was causing them. Then one evening, we discovered a hidden passage deep within the castle. We felt like we had to explore it. As we walked through the passage, we noticed strange symbols and markings on the walls. We all started feeling uneasy and even a bit sick. The atmosphere was really creepy. Then we heard whispers, voices coming from nowhere. Some of my friends were so scared they ran back screaming, but a few of us kept going. Suddenly, a loud, piercing scream echoed through the passage, and we all screamed and ran out in terror. There was a door at the end of the passage, but it was clear that something didn't want us to reach it. Later, we met a local historian at a pub who told us the castle had a dark past involving witchcraft and the occult. He warned us to stay away, but by then, we were too intrigued. We just had to find out what was behind that door. The next night, we returned to the passage, tiptoeing all the way to the door. When we finally opened it, we found a round room with an altar in the middle, melted candles scattered around. There were old knives and swords, strange symbols on the walls, and a big red pentagram painted on the floor. One of my friends had the idea to light the candles and try to communicate with whatever was haunting the castle. In hindsight, it was a terrible idea, but at the time, it felt like part of the adventure. We lit the candles and started asking silly questions like, is anybody here? And what do you want from us? We didn't really know what we were doing, but with all the strange things that had been happening, we felt like something had to respond. Just as we were about to give up, all the candles blew out at once and the door slammed shut. We screamed and rushed to the door, but it wouldn't budge. We panicked, but we managed to light the candles again, trying to figure out a way to escape. Then we noticed thick, black smoke swirling around the room. It grew denser and eventually formed into a shadowy figure above the altar. The figure let out a deep, terrifying growl that didn't sound human. The sound grew louder and louder, coming from all around us. One of my friends finally kicked the door open, and we all ran out of there, never looking back. That night, none of us slept. Instead, we spent hours researching everything we could about the castle. We discovered that it had a long history of witchcraft, and there were rumors of a shadow demon that witches had summoned long ago to do their bidding. We realized how lucky we were to have made it out alive. Looking back, it was foolish to investigate something so dangerous without knowing what we were getting into. We were lucky that none of us were seriously hurt, or worse. That experience changed my life and taught me the importance of respecting forces we don't fully understand. Now I still have an interest in the supernatural, but I approach it with a lot more caution. I've learned that there are dark forces in the world, and it's important to be careful when dealing with things we can't control. But I've also learned that we have the power to make positive choices and protect ourselves from negative influences.
For as long as I can remember, I have been working really hard for something important. In high school, my main focus was to get into a good university. I made sure my grades were excellent and that I participated in extracurricular activities. After that, I concentrated on getting my degree so I could land a good job. I poured everything into my career. It worked out well because I now hold a respected position in my field and have achieved many things. But something was missing. I couldn't remember the last time I took time for myself. It had probably been two decades since I had a proper break. I decided to change that. I wanted to do something big, something different from my usual routine. So, I planned a solo road trip around the southwestern United States. I packed a suitcase, used my vacation time, and started driving. It was the freest I had felt in years. I visited all the major cities, enjoyed the sights, and soaked in the beauty of nature along the way. I had carefully planned my route, including where I would stay each night. My accommodations were a mix of hotels, Airbnbs, and some homes where kind hosts let travelers like me stay for the night. The trip was amazing, but I noticed something odd. It didn't bother me much at the time, but now, looking back, I wonder if it meant something. In the busy areas like cities, suburbs, and small towns, everyone acted normally. The clerks, hotel staff, and people who worked with the public were polite and friendly. But when I ventured into the more remote desert areas, the people seemed different. They weren't rude exactly, but they were very short with me. It was like they didn't want me there. They kept to themselves, and I felt unwelcome. Maybe it was just me being paranoid, but sometimes I wonder if they were hiding something they didn't want strangers to see. Still, I didn't let it spoil my trip. I wasn't there to make friends, and as long as I had a place to sleep, I was happy. About halfway through my trip, I found myself deep in the desert for a couple of days. I had booked a night at an Airbnb. It was a cute little house far from any town with nothing but quiet surroundings for miles. This was my first time staying in an Airbnb on the trip. Up until that point, I had always been around other people, whether it was hosts or hotel staff. But this time, I would be completely alone for the night. I was excited. A peaceful house all to myself, no traffic sounds, no city lights, just me, the stars, and the desert. When I arrived, I settled in quickly. I watched the sunset, and when the stars came out, I was amazed. Without the city's light pollution, the view was breathtaking. The night air grew chilly, so I made myself some hot chocolate, wrapped up in a blanket, and watched a movie before falling asleep. Everything was perfect. But then something strange happened. I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night, and no matter what I did, I couldn't fall back asleep. It was like my body knew something was off. The air felt different, almost like it was charged with electricity. Everything felt tense, like something big was about to happen, even though nothing had. I thought maybe I was just nervous about being alone in the Airbnb for the first time, so I went outside to get some fresh air. The stars were even more stunning than before, shining brightly in the clear sky. Then, I saw a shooting star. I was thrilled. It was the first one I had ever seen in real life. But then I saw another one. And another. Soon, there were more shooting stars than I could count. Four, five, six, and they just kept coming. I couldn't believe my luck. But then, the stars started behaving strangely. Instead of falling towards the horizon like normal shooting stars, they began looping around in the sky. More and more stars joined in, flying in circles. I quickly realized these weren't shooting stars. I didn't know what they were, but even I knew that stars don't move like that. The lights formed a giant glowing circle, spinning high above me. 
Suddenly, the circle turned a bright blue, lighting up the entire sky like a massive flash of lightning. But the light didn't fade. It stayed, casting a blue glow over the desert. I don't know how long I stood there staring up at it. Time seemed to stop. Then, there was a loud cracking sound, like a branch breaking, but as loud as thunder. I woke up the next morning, feeling confused. My alarm had gone off several times, but I didn't remember turning it off. I also didn't remember going back to bed after seeing the lights.